Um, thank you, sorry for the dogs. Thank you for joining the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. As the business landscape continues to fundamentally change as a result of the COVID pandemic, we are dedicated to bringing you valuable insights and impact and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and extending our impact regionally, nationally, and globally. This series is aligned with our mission for advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good for the global community. We are excited to host our first interactive session with Kelly Watson, Managing Partner of Orange Grove Consulting. She is a gender equity and inclusion specialist and expert and lecturer with our LMU Executive MBA program. Kelly has co-authored a book um, the, the Orange Line, A Women's Guide to Integrating Career, Family, and Life. Her upcoming book on building inclusive workplaces will be published this fall 2020, so be on the lookout for that. Kelly will be talking to us today about inclusive leadership strategies to keep employees engaged. Um, Kelly will also talk to us about our Zoom guidelines and how the interactive session will happen today. And I wanted to remind everyone that this session is being recorded. We will share the PowerPoint and any materials with you. So without further ado, Kelly Watson. Thank you, Nola. All right, let me just grab my screen here and share it for you. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining this session. You know, I, this is obviously work that's near and dear to my heart and very important to me because it's the basis of, of research, but also in, in the current times that we have going on right now, both with the COVID pandemic as well as the Black Lives Matter. It's more important than ever that we um, really focus on these inclusive leadership skills, how to build them and how to, how to ensure that we get the maximum engagement from our talent. Um, Today's session, we're going to be a little more interactive than I think some of the previous sessions that you've attended. So it's not webinar style. This is uh, more workshop style because um, I like to have the input of the audience and I feel like we can learn from each other as much as you can learn from me. So I want to make sure that you have that opportunity. So that's going to mean that you have to be a little less shy maybe than you have been in some of the webinars. Um, uh, there are a number of ways that you can participate. So uh, you can, while we're going through, I'm going to, I'm basically going to walk you through a couple of, you know, model, a model and some, some other information. And then I want it to be as interactive as possible. So if you prefer to use the chat, that's quite fine. We have some moderators here that will help me with the chat, but you can also unmute yourself and go ahead and speak up. I'm happy to have that. And there will be a portion where we're going to break you into breakout groups so that we can work together and workshop a little bit. Um, and you'll have an opportunity then to meet some of the other folks that are on the uh, involved in the workshop. Um, if for whatever reason I get cut off um, or, or you get cut off, just try to dial back in. We will have a backup slide running and I'll be able to call in if if we are to get cut off. Um, there also, if you have something and you don't want to interrupt something that someone else is saying, you can use the put up your hand feature, or if your video is on, you can just wave and we can see you that way as well. So Nola, did you, I noticed that Dale joined. Did, did Dale want to say something before I keep going? I'll just say hello. I was having trouble with the link and apparently Larry and I are sharing the link, but I hope that's okay. That's totally fine. Anyway, welcome everyone. Great to see you all here and over to you, Kelly. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, um, so let's get started. Today's learning objectives. Oh, first of all, who are we? So thank you for the introduction, Nolly. You gave a little bit of insight on what we are. So we help organizations. We do women's leadership development training. We also train leaders on how to be inclusive leaders. And we help organizations with bias removal, where we actually systematically um, take apart processes and take apart things in the pipeline that are um, preventing women and people of color from moving through organizations. So that is that is the, the specialist work I do. Um, so today's learning objectives, you know, that there are three, and I, I realize it's a little bit ambitious, but um, what we hope to do today is give you an opportunity to learn how to identify opportunities for improved engagement. Uh, identify and remove some common barriers to engage to inclusion in your organization and to learn some strategies to improve, improve your own inclusive leadership skills. 
I'm going to flip it a little and start with the inclusive leadership skills piece so that you can kind of see the framework and then we'll get into some of the tactics. Um, but to begin, I'd like to do just a quick poll, if I could. Um, how do you think people are feeling right now? Let me launch the poll. How do you think people are feeling? Do you think they're feeling more included or less included at this moment? What are your thoughts? Kelly, there might be people in the waiting or in um, the breakout rooms. And I have to open them to sign them. So please don't go in <laughs> until we give you the word. Okay, can you remove them? It's giving okay. it 60 seconds. I tried to take that off. Okay, super. All right, so we got so far 50-50. Anybody else wanna weigh in? Is anyone confused on how to participate in the poll? Good, okay, we have 42% of you. Super. Ah, so this is interesting. So, so far, more of you feel that people are feeling more included or less included. So using the chat, give me some, or if somebody wants to speak out, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Why do you feel, think people are feeling more included now, for example? Anyone want to participate? I know that, um, oh, longstanding issues being seen in diversity of protest groups. So, so Jeff, tell me more. What, you think people are being more included because the protests have heightened the awareness, maybe? Of well, what, I, I, the question was if they feel more included, not if they are being more included. So I was right. responding to the feeling piece. And um, my guess is that people are feeling that there is an appreciation for things being publicly seen in ways that have been obscured. And secondly, that the, um, the protests are really multi-ethnic protests as opposed to one constituency protesting. Right, right. So you're seeing that people are, you know, are, are feeling like finally there's maybe some um attention given to what's going on yeah and, and maybe broader shared ownership and broader shared ownership of it yeah i i think that that's that's that could be true um what else what are people feeling in the workplace i know when nola and i were talking about this yesterday one of the, the observations we were making was that you know some folks like introverts are maybe being heard more because um, the extroverts are, are kind of, there's, there's kind of this equalizing um, thing going on where, you know, all of our Zoom faces are the same size. And so it's harder for the extroverts to take over the whole, the whole call, especially in how it's facilitated. So maybe the introverts are getting an opportunity to speak up. But who's being left out? Any thoughts on anyone being left out right now? Um, hi, I'm Jan, I'll, I'll um, chime in on that. I think people who um, don't have access to certain um, resources are being left out. Example, just technology, if they don't have access to internet or devices, um, they, they can easily be left out in something like this. Yeah, that's a great one. People uh, being left out of, um, you know different meetings because maybe their technology isn't working well or they didn't have the technology to begin with and so they had to be that had to be shored up quickly i know some companies i've heard they had to send desktop computers home with people because people didn't have laptops it wasn't you know people weren't comfortable using um zoom for things i, I have one client that's a, a animal hospital and their doctors hadn't really adopted the telemedicine thing so you know it was sort of like they were Took by, taken by surprise because now they've got to have video conferencing with people. Um, on, on the other hand, that's kind of pushed that technology really well. I know there are people who live in the Hollywood Hills who don't have great um, reception. And so they've been left out because they can't join audio calls or they can't, um, they're, they're having more difficulty getting, getting tied in. So yeah, technology is a great example of people who might not be um, included at the moment. Um, all right, I'm gonna to go to the next bit. So why is it important? I mean, obviously if you've joined this call, you at some point or at some level believe that inclusive leadership is something that's important that you wanna either learn more about. But you know, it, it kind of comes back to this whole idea of cognitive diversity, that we know that 
more diverse companies have a better return, right? More diverse teams innovate more because this innovation comes from diversity, not from homogeneity. You know, we, we bridge things like, or we, we transcend groupthink when we have more diversity, right? So, um, but diversity on its own is, is it, uh, it's, it's part of the equation. But the other piece of it is that we have to be able to do something with these diverse, with this cognitive diversity, right? If folks aren't included for whatever reason, whatever those barriers are, then they're less likely to, feel like they're making a contribution. And we know that making a feeling, that feeling of involvement and in making a contribution is a big part of what brings people's passion to light and, and brings their, their true, their best selves. And there are a lot of people for a lot of different reasons that um, aren't, that don't feel they're able to bring their whole selves to work. Um, you know, I, I, I've worked with companies where um, people who uh, don't identify on the gender spectrum necessarily with, you know, the traditional gender roles have struggled because they feel like they have to keep that part of themselves out of the workplace. So somebody, you know, as simple as asking them, you know, what'd you do this weekend puts up a whole bunch of barriers and then they become seen as someone maybe who isn't participating at their full level or is holding some part of themselves back. And so it's, it's really important that we, um, leverage the benefits of diversity and the way we do that is through inclusion. So I wanted to also point out that um, some data that says that nearly half of American millennials say a diverse and inclusive workplace is an important factor in job search. So it used to be the case that you could have a homogeneic, you know, sort of workplace and that was okay that you were going to be able to attract talent, but it's increasingly not the case. So people are expecting that the workplace be more diverse and the younger generation, it's, it's becoming something that's actually going to attract them versus um, having them go in, in the other direction. And we know we need that talent. We know we need the younger generation to come in. So it's, it's becoming more and more, more critical. So let me, let me, ask you this let's throw this out to the group what do you when you when you hear inclusive leadership what does that mean to you any ideas thoughts or examples what does that look like maybe it's easier to say what happens when it's not there have you been in an environment that hasn't been inclusive or, or have you ever, been, what's, think about a time when you um, haven't felt particularly like. Don't make me call. Okay, I'll chime in. Uh, uh, something. Uh, so um, some someone who might not feel like there's um, inclusive leadership may feel um, like intimidated or not heard or may not speak up or want to share ideas because they may feel they may get shut down or um, may feel bi biased towards them. exactly it yeah they, if they feel that they, if their contributions to get shot down or that it's just too hard to contribute they're going to hold that part of themselves right and then we don't have what we hope to get out of that because it's suppressed that's exactly right do you want to does it feel good do you want to work in those conditions are you bringing your best in those conditions probably not right exactly so it's a really important. So here's, I wanted to share with you, this is from our upcoming book. This is the, the work we've been doing. We've actually identified a taxonomy of these capabilities of leadership because the real problem we're finding in organizations is this isn't measured, right? We've got all of these other capabilities that we measure and, and you'll see some of the words on this page, you know, we measure executive um, inspiration and we, and, and um, they're, the ability to create direction in a company and we, we measure executives for their influence and we measure their business judgment but we don't for the most part most organizations don't today measure their their executives for inclusiveness and here's the problem so we continue to to put people up into leadership that have no idea how to measure a diverse team how to manage a diverse team and we expect them to perform we expect them to have diversity and that you know as you know nothing in business happens if we don't have measurement right a, a way to actually quantify these skills 
So we actually developed this taxonomy, which really looks at all of the, you know, traditional executive leadership competencies. And instead of saying diversity is this thing over here, it actually, we embed it in every single one of those capabilities. So, and, and here's how you move yourself up the, the taxonomy. So it starts with diversity, right? So we, we want to have diversity. We want to have some level of cognitive diversity on our teams. And some people buy into that and some people don't. But the folks that buy into it, we're hearing a lot of this right now, this diverse inspiration, is people are putting out statements and saying, gosh darn it, it's time. We're going to have better diversity. We're going to have, you know, gender parity at the top. We're going we're gonna to get more people into the pipeline. Yes, it's going to happen and we're going to make a commitment. And so you're seeing a lot of these symbolic sort of ceremonial gestures. And these are all really good. Being inspired to make change is really, really good. You're also hearing a little bit, I think, of pushback from folks in the Black Lives Matter movement that are saying, stop talking about it and do it, right? So, so our point is, is that diversity in and of itself is not enough, right? We have to go to the next level. The next level is inclusion. It's being able to um, understand all of the different groups and hear them and hear their points of view um, because we understand them. So this requires a level of diversity, intelligence, and experience. So if you think about David Livermore's model, where he talks about um, having these, this inspiration and then having these capabilities, he talks about this in the context, I think, of an expat working in a foreign location, but we've brought it into the, the um, multicultural environment that we live in every day in America here, where we're saying you need to have intelligence about all kinds of different groups, outgroups, and being aware that you have biases, internal biases, and that these outgroups all have a different perspective, I think is the next, is absolutely the next level. And that's what we're talking about with this inclusion level is, okay, now we understand that somebody else can have a different perspective on the exact same experience as I do. The third level and where we really, you know, want to try to push folks to next is the ability to give a voice to those, you know, it's, it's not enough to just have everybody at the table. Now I want to hear what they have to say. And, you know, we think about um, things like being able to tailor our products to different communities because we've given voice to that community and being able to hear that that community, you know, is missing something. You know, we talk about like the seatbelt seat belt laws that were, or the, the um, airbags rather, that were developed using the average human being, right? Which was a male and it was, um, you know, skewed for the average male. And what we found was that women and children were actually being killed by the airbags because what we did, what was average, you know, we, we assumed that women were included in that average, but really women skewed on the bottom end of it. And um, we, we found that it actually was detrimental. It was, you know, it killed people, it killed women. And children. So what we have to realize is that each of these communities has to have a voice in how we develop things. You know, I think about AI being developed now in Silicon Valley, which is, you know, predominantly white men. And I think what are the implications for all of the other communities when we develop the computers to think in, in a very biased way. So voice is being able to actually bring the, the experience and the um, voices of all the different groups to the table and include them in, in our products. And then the final level is synthesis. Synthesis is where we actually change the business, where we actually allow the communities in and, and hear the voices and then integrate it with how we do business. And so being able to collaborate, being able to exercise business judgment, all of those are things that actually synthesizes all this information and for, for the better. And that may mean changing how we do business. That may mean um, making decisions differently and allowing you know, the, the minority voices to actually have more than just a voice, but actually change, make some change. And so this is the, the taxonomy that we've, we've developed. Now, in terms of leading this and, and getting your, your skills, obviously, as you move up, there's a lot more um, difficulty, there's a lot more commitment, um, but it's also more strategic. The higher, the higher up you go on this taxonomy, the more strategic your capabilities are. All right, um, so we talked a little bit about what's, what's going wrong for people right now, who is less engaged, who is excluded, and who is succeeding. So um, I just wanna give you a couple examples that I've seen in our work, and then we're gonna work, we're gonna work specifically more on your company in just a second. But some things that we've seen, um, who is less engaged right now? Um, parents of children who can't, can't be left alone is a big community, right? Because the, um, 
the, the schools are closed, the summer camps are for the most part closed. And so folks are at home and they've got, you know, kind of a big distraction going on. Um, I heard this in a company the other day that's called all their employees back to work now and is saying, we just have to get daycare, you just have to figure it out. And the implications for those folks is, you know, is really quite huge that they're, um, the extra pressure to get back to the office and what happens when they're not in the office and those voices aren't heard. Um, the other is parents of elderly, they're children of elderly parents. So if there's a, a large community. One of the companies I work with has a very um, big Hispanic population working for them. And many of those folks have generations living in the household and they don't want to go back to work because they don't want to expose the people in their household to what they might bring home. Um, you know, you think about the mask versus no mask battle, and there, there's a lot of controversy now because it's been made politicized that the folks that are wearing masks are, are making a political statement, and, and, and it's not just about their health, and the folks that aren't are making a political statement. But what happens when you walk into work and the person in the cubicle next to you is chosen for political reasons not to wear a mask? How does that impact you? Well, you know, we don't know for the for, for, for one thing. So it's one of these things that's creating a lot of conflict in the organization. But secondly, it's, there's a possibility that it could hurt you. So do you feel included? Does that make you feel included? Does that make you feel safe um, in your environment? And some organizations have been, like LMU, have been fantastic about really following the guidelines that have been set out and not really questioning it from a political point of view, but just saying, look, we're going to do the top standard because we want to protect people. But that's not been my experience in all organizations. And so there's a real problem out there for folks not feeling safe at work um, and, and feeling like their indication that they're not safe at work has maybe some political ramifications. Um, there's also the, you know, people of color feeling that there might be ramifications for them for having participated or not participated in, in the protests and in what's going on. Um, so there, there's a lot of communities that are feeling excluded right now. Maybe people who don't like change, you know, is another group. They didn't want to go to Zoom. They didn't, they were resisting sort of having to do this work from home thing. I, I'm thinking of one CEO that I know um, who just doesn't want to believe that the world has changed right now. And so the, the ramification are for everybody around that CEO are that they have to perform the way he's expecting, otherwise they're excluded now. So um, any other examples? Does anyone want, else want to share another community that they're noticing that is being less than fully engaged right now? Or who, who, some, a community that's succeeding maybe that, that hadn't expected to at this point? Any thoughts? I can, I can um, share. I work with special ed providers and we, we provide services one-on-one -on -one at the schools. When the schools closed their doors, we went on to virtual services. And a lot of the younger providers, they had no problem. They loved the, the new way of doing business. However, I have some providers that are older folks who had a real difficult time getting the, the platform that we were using to provide virtual services. They really pushed back. I, I still have some providers that are not providing services at all. They're, they decided, no, you know what, this is not for me. Uh, and they opted for unemployment and, and that's the way it's going to be. Some of them came around. I was surprised. I have uh, older providers, a uh, teacher who's deaf and hard of hearing, uh, doing an amazing job. She really tried her best. It took us hours trying to get her on and, and to find out what's the process every morning. But she did a phenomenal job. This is a lady who's 78 years old. Wow. Um, but I'm, I was blown away. So there is a way to do it. But you just have to, they, the older population, they just have to want to. Many of them, like I said, even younger folks, 60 year olds, that decided, no, this is not for me, and, and they just shut down. And, and I have quite a few of those. Yeah, that, you're making a great point that, you know, in some cases, it's the folks that have the open mindset, right? That growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And so here's a, a great example of, you know, it, if you didn't naturally have a, a growth mindset to begin with, 
you're falling further back than you would have, you know, that might have been hidden or, or your inability to maybe in your inflexibility for change might have been kind of um, buffered. But now it's becoming very plain. Who are the folks that are willing to just dig in and figure out a way, right? Who have that growth mindset of, I'll find a new way. How can, how can we, you know, every problem can be solved. Let's figure out how to do it versus the folks that are like, no, I need to sit this one out because I don't, I don't have the ability to change. So that's a fantastic example. Um, so if I look at um, the, the different barriers to change that we have right now, I think like, like you were just saying, Cynthia, some of them are internal. It may be biases that we have about growth, about ourselves, about the world. Um, some of them are going to be external. So, you know, people jumping to conclusions. And here's one I jumped to really early on is I thought everybody is going to want to go, um, that, you know, work from home, right? Because I've been working from home for years. I love it. I personally thrive in this environment. I've written two books this way and collaborated with my business partner who is in Boston. And so for me, this is a thriving environment because I feel hugely productive and everything else. Why wouldn't everyone want to do this? And um, what I realized is there, there are people in this environment who actually don't have a workspace. I'm lucky I have a little she shed and I you know, have a home office, but a lot of people don't actually have a space to work and they have extended families or big families in their home. And so they're at a kitchen table. Those folks, they don't wanna work from home because it's very distracting, it's hard to focus, it's not the ideal environment. They wanna be back in their office where they can you know, have all the tools that they need around them to be able to print, to be able to, you know, whatever, whatever those tools are. And socialize um, with people because you know, my sister, for example, who's a tremendous extrovert, can't stand this being at home thing. It's, it's actually really impacting her mental health. She needs to be around people, she feeds on people. So, um, so there's an example of, you know, just some biases that I had that about myself that I was applying to, the, you know, the rest of the world. And if I was running a large organization, that would be a mistake because not everybody feels the same way. Um, just like the CEO who wants everybody back, he feels that his work only happens when it's in the office. He literally used the word back to work until the HR folks said, well, it's back to the office because we've all been working for the last three months. Um, so, you know, so our own internal biases are a real problem. Then there's the external biases, the, the, the in-group, out-group dynamics and, and how that works. Those are always a, a barrier and, and they're not always conscious, right? Some of these biases that we're learning about probably in the last couple of weeks really are things that we may not have had any, any awareness of before. And then the third is the structural. So it's, it's this idea of when work gets done, how it gets work done and, um, and what are the processes that could potentially need to change. And I know that again, LMU, you folks have dealt with just an incredible amount of policy change and process change throughout this whole thing. And to Dale's credit, she's been just fantastic at being able to see the next problem and thinking, okay, what do we do? And, and how, what, do, what do we need to change in the structure to get those structural barriers out of the way? I mean, in the very beginning, it was, it was things like, um, you know, how do we process days off, right? Like what's a day off? What's not a day off? And how do we do sick time and, and things like that? We had all of these structures that were really designed around a go to the office kind of environment. And now it's, it, a lot of that has been thrown up in the air. So, so these are examples of barriers now to inclusion that we hadn't even thought of before, you know, COVID and, and the Black Lives Matter. So, um, I mean, we, we have an entire lexicon of them that we work with organizations to try to remove just for getting women to be equally represented in leadership. So, so how do we remove them? What's the big piece here? Um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example of some barriers. I joined a group recently, I went to a couple of meetings and, um, it was very formal and very structured, so it wasn't easy for people to connect, you know, and, and get to know each other. It kind of relied on you to have to go out of your, yourself a little bit and walk up to people and, you know, because most of the meetings were really, really structured. Then they went, then COVID happened and it went online. And now it's even more so, like there's just no time in the Zoom call for anybody to really get to know each other. And then when you need people to work on a committee with you, it's like, there's no, how do you get people to connect with you? when there, there isn't this. So one of the things that's, that's striking me about this particular meeting is that the facilitator, the, the leader, doesn't seem to even notice that nobody's connecting, that like nothing's happening, nothing's moving forward. So a big part of, of being able to remove barriers is first to notice. And we're gonna do, our exercise today is gonna be based on noticing. Um, the, the second thing we need to do then is 
to set a conscious direction that says we absolutely want to include more people here that this is something conscious that that we need to build so we need to have a goal for that and and be conscious about it um then the third is being able to give everyone a voice in that process you know I, again i i looked to, to the leadership that dale has offered through this whole pandemic where she immediately pulled people together from across the organization and said we need to have a voice we need to have all the voices at the table and she's got constant you know these steering committees for all of these issues and she's just bring out the voices bring out the voices because we need people to be part of the process um, and so again being conscious about giving people a voice and not trying to solve the problem on your own and then um, finally being an ally so if we see that there are folks that um, you know have things have barriers or have um, biases against them. Noticing is great and we're starting, I think, in this context to really see a lot more, but we have to be an ally. We have to be willing to put ourselves out there and if we notice something's wrong in a meeting or we notice something's going on, we have to be, have the moral courage, right? And this is part of the CBA vision. We have to have the moral courage to be able to be an ally and to speak up and to say something and to bring others along with us and not just go, go it alone. Um, so, so that's just a model for, for what we're doing. What I'd love to do now, though, is really um, make this a little more concrete. So our activity today has two parts. The first part of it is um, to actually, as an individual, so as we're forming the, the breakout groups, I want everyone to take a couple of minutes and just write down the names of your team members, the folks around you. It doesn't matter if you're in a position of leadership or not. It, it may be your whole company if you are a small business. Um, and, and if you are a sole proprietor, it may even be your family or your support network around you, right? The people that you normally need to get your business going. Um, write down their name. And then, and, and by the way, there is a handout. Nola, did you put the handout in the chat? or could you put a link to the handout in the chat? There's a handout for this, so you can just check a box. It's a fillable PDF that you can use to do this activity, but fill in the name and then, you know, um, just put in a little tick. Are, are the folks stuck right now? Are they neutral? Are they highly productive? And are they so productive that they're supporting others in this, in this process? And it, the reason we do this is it's really important to think of our employees not as a mass group, everybody want, will have to do it this way, but to really look at them from an individual perspective and see what their individual needs are. I call this CRM, internal CRM, right? It's, it's like customer management, but it's done at the individual team member level. So, so take a moment, write down your teammate and, and where they are, and then really try to understand why. And if you don't know why, that's okay. Put a question mark because your homework will be to go find out why. Why are they stuck? Why are they neutral? Why are they so productive? What's working well for them? All right, so that's part one. Any questions about part one? I'm not seeing your faces, so I can't tell if you're confused or I can see. No questions on my part. No questions? Nobody's in chat questions? Okay. So that's part one. Next thing we're going to do, so you can be doing that as we form the groups. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna break you into groups. I want you to, number one, introduce yourself, your company and your role. That's gonna take a few minutes, but we want everyone to get to know each other and use this as a networking opportunity. Um, the second is to talk about the biggest barrier that you've identified. So as you look at this, this individual assignment that you've done, take a look and say, what's the biggest barrier? What are the things that are keeping my folks from being able to be their best? And is it internal? Is it external? Is it structural? What is it? Don't try to solve yet, but just identify what is it? What's the biggest barrier? And then work with the group, okay? Um, what I love the group members to do for each other is give ideas, um, and, and I want you each to not necessarily reject an idea say, or say all the reasons why that, that can't work, but just to take down the ideas. Just utilize this group around you to get as many ideas as possible for how you might be able to remove these barriers for your votes. All right. Are there any questions about what we're doing there? All right. And then when you come back to the main group, what we'll do is we'll have you share some of the ideas that come back. I will join you. I will, I will hop around some of the groups. Um, we will take 10 minutes. Um, hopefully the groups will be two to three people. I was just piggybacking off of what you were saying. And I said, it's, 
it's like we're flying we're building an airplane as it's flying that's all i wanted to say thank you yeah it's, it's a new world these are great skills that we're acquiring all right so um i heard some really good ideas um that i was hoping would get out there um so one of the one of the categories of barriers i guess that i heard a number of times was this idea of the personal connection and the water cooler talk like we're missing water cooler talk and i, I will say that i i um attended a webinar where i heard some interesting stats that productivity is actually up well fake productivity is up during the pandemic because people are actually working more hours so it's not really productivity it's that people are frankly working more hours because they don't have as much to maybe do and they there's no commute and everything um, now that's not sustainable and that's not incremental, you know, productivity growth that we're going to get some innovation out of for the future because it's limited by exactly how many hours we can possibly work. Um, what is, so, so that's just one interesting note. The other is, and this is the, the part that's more alarming, is that collaboration is way down. It's down by like 45% right now. And it's, it's some of what you folks, what um, Daniel was talking about with not having the water cooler conversation ability and so so i heard some interesting ideas um that i would love for you folks to share uh daniel do you want to talk about some of the stuff um that you guys were talking about for improving the ability to have sort of more um, of the informal collaboration sure uh, yeah um i i, I can throw out a couple ideas um so uh, and Nancy and I, we were talking about how um, we miss the water cooler talk or it just feels so, I don't wanna say it feels cold when we're on um, just using Zoom or speaking via email and, and, and chat. Um, and we were trying to think of ways of how to better reach out to our, our, our um, team members. And one of the ways that I found um, that worked much better than, um, I had hoped, but it, it ended up working very well was just the regular phone call. I, I check in with my team, I give them a call and somehow they, they open up much more than if we were in a team meeting or um, chatting via Zoom. Something about using a computer is just, I mean, we grew up in a generation that we feel safe or in like a little bubble of using a computer saying whatever we wanna say and, and it can be taken out of context. Whereas when you give um, someone a phone call, People are very um, familiar with that. Um, this that human, the human voice um, through a phone just sounds way different than through a, a mic on a computer. Yeah, yeah. And then Nancy, you had some ideas too. Can you share? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I too miss the the water cooler banter, and I and I also miss laughter. That uh, the interaction that i've been having there there hasn't been um much lightheartedness so i was thinking of starting sort of game times maybe instead of the happy hour time but game times where we could be a little bit sillier and let our hair down a little bit more the happy hours um, though i enjoy them also seem a little bit stiff so i i think uh, maybe lightening it up a little bit would be helpful for the admin team at CBA. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. You know, she, um, Nancy was sharing that they were doing happy hours at first, but then it kind of became boring. I guess the novelty had gone away. I also think there's um, facilitation skill is a really important skill that, you know, people may not be employing in that situation. And so not giving everybody airtime and, you know, something that a device that I've seen in meetings that I think works well is um, new and good, you know, tell me something new, tell me something good that's happened. Joe, Joe uses these a lot in his team meetings and it's really helpful because otherwise, you know, an introvert could sit on a call and not, not even participate. And we have no idea how they're doing. And there's just, you're right. There's none of that sitting down at the meeting beforehand, getting coffee, getting ready for the meeting time. Um, another skill I've seen people do is um, giving the first five minutes of the meeting, getting up and leaving as the boss, as the manager, and letting the team just chat while you say, oh, hang on, I got to go grab something, and then letting them chat, and then coming back and starting the formal agenda five or 10 minutes in. And that way, everybody's you know, had a chance to kind of have a little chit chat without the boss in the room sort of thing. Um, any others? What, what are some of the things that other teams came up with? Don't make me call on you. 
then you may be on mute. Cynthia, you had some insights. Yes, um, I was. T we were talking about how um, in our, you know, in the conversation with my team, as we were talking about returning to the office, I had an employee come up with uh, an issue, which it, my initial reaction was, "Oh no, I mean, you didn't have a problem before; you shouldn't have a problem now." However, after looking at what you presented, becoming an ally, I'm thinking, um, I, I'm thinking, man, I'm so glad I didn't respond yet to, to that employee because you're right. I need to, we need to be more inclusive. We need to be more compassionate and uh, because I don't know what her situation really is and I don't know what she's not sharing that I should still consider. So um, I love that, that, um, that comment, of the, the, the statement about inclusion. I mean, not inclusion, um, becoming an ally. That yeah. just brought that uh, a different sense. You know, you're bringing up a great point, Cynthia, about what is someone not sharing? Um, you know, they don't have to tell you why, right? It, 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 in some of these situations, you know, <laughs> you're right. So childcare, for example, yeah, they might've had it sorted before, but now they feel it's risky. And it's not, you know, again, this is not debatable in the sense that, you know, is it, we don't know with COVID, right? We don't know how we're getting it. We don't know how it's getting passed on. We don't know who's getting it, why they're getting it. You know, there's just so little known. And so if someone's scared, it doesn't matter if it's a real fear or not a real fear. It's their fear. It's very real to them. And so to exclude them based on your own opinion is really quite unfair. And so I love that you've sort of, you know, been able to articulate that that is that's also a piece of this inclusion it's like let's not debate it it just is that person doesn't want to come for whatever reason are they a productive employee do they get a lot done absolutely so how do yeah. we how do we make it work you know and and i think that we do have the capability as humans to discern you know we, we've we've seen it a lot as managers to hr policy and, and I think now what we're seeing is that there are opportunities for leaders to take back some of that discernment power and say, you know, when is an employee um, not at their best and why are they not at their best? And is it something that we can impact, that we can do something about? And that's, you know, that's the moral courage to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit longer. I'm going to listen a little harder and find out what's going on before I make a, a judgment about an employee. Right. So here's the takeaway, because I always like to give you folks homework, right? So the takeaway is um, for you to think about personally, what is one thing you can, you, you plan to do this week to improve engagement? You know, it could just be listen. It could just be stop and, and give a voice to some of these folks. It could be, like Daniel said, reach out and, and make a personal connection to try to find out. So one thing, you need to write it down and do it. And then I wanted to go back to that include that leadership taxonomy that I that I shared with you, um, and and get you to spend some time really trying to figure out where do you think you fall on the inclusive leadership taxonomy. You know, are you still at the ceremonial level saying diversity is important, or you know, have you made an effort to improve inclusion? Do people who are different from the main group have a voice in your organization or on your team? Or are you really, re you know, innovating and, and integrating all of that and in, in synthesizing um, diverse cognitive diversity on your team so that you can you can do something better? And if you want, there is an inclusive. Um, I have a little assessment test on our website. I will put in the chat what the link is to that um, so that you can um, go ahead and, and assess yourself or just you know, give a thought to the taxonomy. But essentially, I'd love you to figure out where you think you are on that, that taxonomy and what could you do to improve your inclusive leadership skills. All right. So any thoughts or final questions? I, I can't believe I stuck to my time. That's like a first for me. <laughs> so, but I'm happy to, I wanted to honor your time and make sure that, that you, um, you get all your questions answered, so I'm willing to stay on a little bit longer and, and we can do a Q&A or you can just share any final thoughts or ideas that you might have. 
Hi, this is Eileen. I actually have been having technical difficulties this entire time, but the one thing that I wanted to say or that's been on my mind a lot is the uh, issue of sustainability in the context of equity. And equity is the big issue in my office in terms of uh, this topic that we're talking about. And I'm, I just wanted to include that in terms of not equality, but equity in terms of uh, the diversity uh, that we're talking about. You're on. Okay. Um, so our, just a clarifying question, when you're talking about equity, are you talking about um, the power that is the sharing of power in your organization or, or can you give me more of a context? Um, I'm talking about social, uh, like ethnic, eth racial, racial uh, equity. Um, I'm talking about, say, so b basically my manager isn't used to dealing with people who are not white. So she hires, like managers, the, hi the managers that she hires are, are not diverse. So there's not a diverse management. I work for the city of Los Angeles. And if you look at the top of the organization, there's not a lot of people of color on in any um, of the say deputies. And so there may be like, out of like say eight deputies there may be one or two uh, minorities, but for the most part, the deputies are mostly not diverse. Um, so I think when you're looking at equity, you're looking at providing those opportunities to more than just, you know, wh white people. And I'm actually half white. So, you know, I come from a place of where I actually have that entitlement and privilege. But from the Filipino side of me, it looks more like entitlement and privilege instead of equity. So that's a, a personal example of, you know, what drives my passion that why I'm even here today to talk about this with you guys. And it's an, it's a really big issue. Like I, um, uh, the thing that I kind of had an issue with was our mayor, Eric Garcetti was kneeling. I wouldn't say a problem or an issue, but he was kneeling with Black Lives Matter a couple of weeks ago. But I was talking with my coworkers, like, isn't that interesting? He's kneeling with Black Lives Matter, but our, all of our, most of our, I should say, at least, except for two deputies are all white um, people. And I get that, you know, we need to include white people as well, but it's just kind of this paradox that I live in or I work in where on the outside, it seems as if, we really, really want to do it, but what we've been living is not necessarily that message. And I think it's time for us to talk about it openly that, you know, there are great um, de uh, leaders and, and executives that are of different races, of different, like even, um, you know, immigrants or, or something to that effect that are not just in that category. Um, and it affects me as well, because I don't want to be high in a leadership of a company that is that way. Like, I don't even want to get promoted because I'm like, I'm not going to work in an environment or in on a higher level where there is no diversity. So I would rather start my own business and do my own thing and do what we're doing today um, in terms of doing it outside of government. So I hope that explains it a little more. You've just articulated the entire moral reason for why why we exist and why we need to talk about this. and and. You know, I, I, I'll say that, you know, the mayor kneeling and, and you know, some mayors didn't kneel. So I, I think that if we go back to taxonomy, you know, the inspiration at the bottom is, is a step and it's a stage. And, and I agree, it's not enough. It's not, we're not gonna tap the capabilities and, and be able to um, leverage diversity the way you just articulated if we all stay down at the bottom but we got to make that first step because there are plenty that aren't and or, or we're resisting kind of coming out and, and having the inspiration that says we need to make a change, right? Um, but, but then we've got more work to do as this talk, taxonomy shows. And, and the, the thing that I look at is, you know, we, we, we look at um, one of the ways, I guess, we can look at and what we're subconsciously looking at in terms of being able to measure whether or not somebody is an inclusive leader is looking at their team right? If they don't have a diverse team, it's really hard for me to believe that that particular leader has diverse inclusion skills. 
right? Because they haven't proved it. Uh, and, and you're experiencing it, Eileen, where you're seeing these leaders that have, you know, and, and look, it's human nature to want to hire people just like me, because it feels in the short term easier to manage because you can complete my sentences. You know, we already know we have the same background, we have the same experience, so it seems easier. And we also understand about diverse teams that there's more conflict, right? And but conflict is good. And this is what we're trying to teach in terms of the leadership skills of inclusive leaders is that we want to nurture that conflict because in that conflict is the beauty that brings out innovation. It is the, it's um, uh, Shane Snow wrote a book called Dream Teams. And he talks about this tension of conflict, good conflict. It's like an elastic band. If you pull it too far, it snaps, right? Too much conflict, not good, especially if it's personal conflict. But if you don't pull the band at all, there's not enough tension to actually get anything rigorous going on. So you need the band to be halfway between and finding that and being able to, as a leader, you know, facilitate that. That's what we're talking about, inclusive leadership skills. And frankly, I, looking at most organizations and most teams, they don't have it. And I know they don't have it because I look at how diverse their team is. And it wouldn't, if, if they had the skills, they'd have a diverse team, right? So, and, and, Eileen, you and I probably should go to lunch because we could probably have a, a very long philosophical conversation about this. This is 100% my interest, um, my area of study, and I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, Let's do it. I'm actually um, totally up for that. I actually did start my own business, and I want, to, I want to do this work. I do it at work. I do environmental planning, and I'm working with the homeless. I do a lot of social equity and sustainability work, but I want to actually make a difference on my own with my MBA that I got from LMU. So I'm yeah, sorry, and I'm very extroverted. So sorry. Everybody. Excellent. All right, stay on the call. We will connect. <laughs> Anyone else have a thought or an idea that they wanted to share? All right. Well, seeing that, I wanted to just thank you very much, all of you, for your time and for being willing to you know, work as a team today and, and um, make this more interactive. Your participation is what makes this work. So thank you so much. On behalf of LMU and the team here, thank you. Yes, and, and Kelly, I echo Kelly's words. Thank you. And thank you, Kelly, for this insightful and impactful topic, a timely topic and conversation with the group. I really appreciate you and all the work that you do. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing everyone at our next Impact Insights webinar. We'll be discussing um, maximizing uh, the value of your intangible assets. So if you don't know what intangible assets is, please do join us. Other than that, thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, and Patty, 